The core of the 14th Amendment, though, is Section 1. This was what Bingham worked so hard on. Let's look at the language here. Each clause, each wording is important. Number one, it constitutionalizes the principle of birthright citizenship, which was in the Civil Rights Bill. All persons born and naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state within they reside. All persons, nothing about race in here, everybody. But this overturns again the Dred Scott decision, but it states a national principle of citizenship. Now, there's a lot of talk, uh, one hears a lot of talk about uh, an idea which I think ought to be uh, consigned to, along with the dodo bird to history, which is American exceptionalism. You hear this from all sorts of politicians, especially when we're about to go to war, we hear a lot about American exceptionalism, it seems. But in my view, American exceptionalism is largely a, a parochial idea based on lack of knowledge of the rest of the world. A lot of things we think are exceptional aren't that exceptional. But this is an example today of American exceptionalism. There are very, very few countries in the world which adopt this principle today that anybody born there is a citizen. It doesn't matter what your religion is. It doesn't matter what your language is. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity or race is. It doesn't matter when, whether your parents are here legally or not. Although there are some states like Arizona which are trying to abrogate the 14th Amendment and say that the children of illegal immigrants are not born here are not citizens, but that's absurd if you read the language. Birth, there is no country in Europe today that recognizes the principle of birthright citizenship. You can be born in Germany if your parents are like Turkish guest workers and you're not a citizen of Germany. You can be born in England and not be a citizen of England, depending on the nationality of your parents. But in this country, anybody can be a citizen regardless who's born here, regardless of the status of their parents. This is a very fundamental principle of American life since the Civil War. All right, these are the citizens. Oh, by the way, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Who is not subject to the jurisdiction thereof? who's not a citizen, even though they're born in the United States? Native, Native Americans. They're still considered under the jurisdiction of their tribes. There's another group so small as hardly to matter, but it was discussed. Children of diplomats. The wife of the British ambassador has a child in the United States. That child is not a citizen of the United States because the diplomats are here in this other little weird world of diplomatic immunity. But that's a tiny group, doesn't matter. Um, but, all right, what about, so, these citizens, what rights are these citizens supposed to have? Well, the next sentence, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny equal protection of the laws. You've got three fundamental principles here, privileges and immunities of citizens, due process of law, and equal protection of the law. Now, all of those are vague, ill-defined concepts, right? They, their meaning has to be worked out, and over time, it is worked out. And for example, as I said, it's the liberty that a state cannot deprive you of liberty, which was the basis of the decision in Lawrence v. Texas overturning the Texas law criminalizing homosexual behavior. Um, what are the privileges and immunities of citizens? Well, over time, the courts have come to the idea that those are basically the, the principles of the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights applies to the, to the federal government, but over time, the Supreme Court, this is a legal term, has incorporated the Bill of Rights. That is, made the states responsible for adhering to the same liberties that are in the Bill of Rights. So for example, before the war, freedom of religion didn't apply to a state. A state could have an a, a official religion, which some of them did. Not the federal government, but now a state can't do that. Freedom of speech, a state cannot abridge your freedom of speech, just like the federal government. The most recent case here, just a couple of years ago, same thing, incorporation was based on the right to bear arms. 
right? The court overturned a law from Chicago, because the state is also, because the local government is also under this as state, um, banning the ownership of handguns because they said, no, Second Amendment is a fundamental liberty, part of the privileges and immunities of citizens, a state or a local government cannot abridge that. That's using the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, anything that restricts the ability of states to interfere with the rights of citizens is really a 14th Amendment issue. And that's another example of this shift in the federal system. What about equal protection of the law? What does that mean? Well, I mean, you can debate that forever. Is racial segregation a denial of equal protection of the law? These proponents said, no, it's not. The blacks go here, the whites go here. They're both being treated equally. The white guy can't go into the black railroad car. The white guy, the black guy can't go into the white one. The white guy can't go into the black one. So they're both treated equally. What's the problem here? And that was the opinion of the Supreme Court in Plessy v. Ferguson, which we'll talk about down the road, eventually overturned in Brown v. Board of Ed. But my point here is this clause introduces the word equal into the Constitution. There was nothing in the original Constitution about equality among citizens. The only use of the word equality in the original Constitution has to do with the, the number of senators each state has which is not what we usually mean when we talk about equality. It is the 14th Amendment that makes the Constitution what it has become in the 20th century and into the 21st. That is a vehicle to which aggrieved groups and aggrieved individuals can appeal if they feel they are being denied equality. I once was talking about this and somebody said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, what about all men are created equal? But, but that is the Declaration of Independence, right? That is not the Constitution. The Declaration of Independence is a wonderful document, but it has no legal standing. You can't go to court and say, hey, I want my rights under the Declaration of Independence. They show you the door immediately. This makes the Constitution something relevant to individual Americans. The original Constitution is fundamentally a structure of government and a um, allocation of power between the federal government and the states. It has very little to do with individual citizens. The Bill of Rights bars the federal government from interfering with your liberties, which is very important. But now, but the federal government, as we said, was very weak before the Civil War. So it, that didn't have all that much practical effect. Now it's the state governments, which are really what deal with people on the day-to-day -day level, that now are, have to abide by this equality, this principle of equality. Um, so one could go into this forever. I mean, and, you know, there's a giant literature on what the 14th Amendment really means. The main point here is that they put these principles in for future elaboration. Nobody thought that this had solved all the problems. That's why the fifth section, Congress in, over time can enforce this. And their definition of equality may change, their definition of liberty may change. Um, and, you know, it's been, the 14th Amendment's been used for all sorts of um, rights that were not imagined by the Congress of uh, 1866. Now, one other thing about this language uh, uh, is it applies to states, right? No state may do this, that, or the other thing. What about individual or private discrimination? Can a restaurant refuse to serve you because you're black? That's not the state, right? The state is not doing that. That's a, I mentioned this before, that uh, Senator Rand Paul last year said, well, you know, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, yes, if banning racial segregation mandated by law is, that's a violation, sure, the 14th Amendment, you, you can't do that. But what about this, what about a, a private discrimination, he said? That's, that's bad, I don't approve of it, but that's not state action. This is the state action principle. State action. One of the worst constitutional concepts, I believe, that ever has been built into our jurisprudence by the Supreme Court. We will see down the road how it goes in. But much of what is called, it, it creates this, false dichotomy between um, what they call de jure and de facto discrimination, let's say discrimination by law 
and discrimination by individuals. Um, and even when, Congress, when the Supreme Court upheld the Civil Rights Act of, 18, of 1964, banning private discrimination in, by public, you know, by restaurants, hotels, they did not do it under the, four, they were afraid to do it under the 14th Amendment because of that state action clause. They did it under the Commerce Clause. A black guy is trying to drive around the South selling fuller brushes. He can't find a motel. He can't find a restaurant. That interferes with commerce. So therefore, Congress can ban it. That's absurd. That's not why they passed that law, so guys can go around selling fuller brushes. They passed it because private discrimination is a is itself a stigmatization of certain groups of American citizens and ought not to be allowed. And moreover, every single private, it's not a question of whether you have someone in your home, every single restaurant, every single hotel is licensed by the state, is protected by the state. You think when fire breaks out, they're going to say, hey, I don't want the fire department because I'm a private place. No, they, they rely on the state. They're regulated by the state. The, the, the distinction between state and private is much murkier than the jurisprudence um, has, you know, has, has led us to believe. I could give you many examples of that, but I want to continue here. And we will get to that when we see later on how the Supreme Court, little by little, will eviscerate the 14th Amendment in the late 19th century. But anyway, the 14th Amendment is a compromise. That's the f number one thing to remember. It's not what the radicals wanted. They wanted black suffrage. There's no black suffrage in here. It's not the, it was too, more radical than the conservatives wanted. It's less radical than the radicals wanted. The language is convoluted. Um, it's a set of principles that no one knows exactly how they're going to be implemented. Uh, Charles Sumner, there he is, denounced it for recognizing the right of a state to deny men the right to vote. And Thaddeus Stevens, in the last speech in June 1866, when the House passed the 13th Amendment, uh, gave this wonderful uh, peroration, which I will quote for you, uh, where he says, um, he says, in my youth, in my manhood, in my old age, I, found, I fondly dreamed that when any fortunate chance should have broken up the foundation of our institutions and released us from obligations the most tyrannical that ever man imposed in the name of freedom, that the intelligent, pure, and just men of this republic, true to their profession, would have so remodeled all our institutions as to free them from every vestige of human oppression, of inequality of rights. This is the radical dream, the radical vision. A new republic divested of every vestige of inequality of rights. This bright dream, he says, has vanished uh, like the baseless fabric of a dream. Where does that beautiful language come from? The base. Do you know what play? Tempest. Tempest. Thank you. You you know what's going on. <laughs> the baseless fabric of a dream. What politician today would even use that? But more to the point, Stevens didn't say. I'm quoting Shakespeare, guys. People knew that. People knew it. They knew their Shakespeare. James Shapiro, our colleague here, has just published a book in the, in the English department, Shakespeare in America. People knew Shakespeare in the 19th century. They didn't need Stevens to say where that was coming from. Remember The Wizard of Oz, the uh, very beginning? Who is the wizard in the end? He's the traveling Shakespearean actor, right? Anyway, I'm <laughs> digressing here. But uh, the baseless fabric of a dream. I find we are obliged to be content with patching up the worst portions of this edifice and leaving it to be swept through by the storms of despotism. Okay, it's not very good. Well, why then, holding these views, do I select so imperfect a solution? Because I live among men and not among angels. This is Stevens. The radical but the pragmatist. I live among men, not, therefore you have to accept compromise because that's the, you, that, that, that's the nature of, of the politics. 
So they patched up the edifice. They did not create the perfect republic which the radicals dreamed of, which has never existed anywhere. <laughs>